Anna, nice to see you. Okay, I'm having some trouble with my speaker. Can somebody say something? Hi. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Yeah, I was having trouble with it, but I think I got it fixed. It's wonderful to see everybody today. Are you all doing well? Yes. Any any of you guys live in the path of the upcoming hurricane? We have another one coming to the U.S. It's going to hit Florida again. Poor Florida has taken a beating this, this year. All right. Anybody have any questions for me? All right, give me one second here. Uh, availability is... Alistair, good to see you. Thanks for the wave. All right, you should be able to see that animal picture where it says zoology. If not, please let me know. All right, so what we're gonna do today, we are gonna start with a kahoot to say goodbye to our invertebrate friends because we're gonna start studying fishes this week. So first I have a couple invertebrate jokes and I'll warn you in advance, I have a lot of them <laughs> because invertebrate jokes are fun. All right, so here's just a fun cartoon. Why Caterpillar Man never got very far as a superhero. <laughs> wait for me, wait for me. All right, how about this one? When is a baseball player like a spider? When he catches a fly. What did the mother lightning bug say to the father lightning bug? Our sun sure is bright. What do you call a fly without wings? Ah, somebody's got an answer here. Yeah, you've heard that one before, a walk, a walk, great. What is the messiest insect? A litter bug. What do you call a bee that can't make up its mind? A buzz. No, that's a good one. That's a good, that, not what I have though. A maybe. A maybe. What can fly underwater? A bee in a submarine. And finally, what do you call a bee that's having a bad hair day? A frisbee. <laughs> all right, all right, enough of that, enough of that. Let's move on. All right, just a heads up for you guys. Two weeks from today, we will not have a live class. We won't be here. I'm gonna be out of town on that day. You are welcome to come to the Tuesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time class if you want to, or I will post the recording of that Tuesday class before the end of the day on Tuesday. So you'll be able to watch that if you're not able to come. I do apologize. I try really hard not to ever have to cancel classes, but this one is unavoidable. All right. I will remind you of that again next week, and I will also send you uh, a message through Canvas. All right. So we are going to say goodbye to our invertebrates and hello to our friends, the fishes in this class. We're gonna start, like I told you, with a kahoot to say goodbye to the arthropods. So let's get, um, let's get the kahoot up. Remember arthropods are a kind of invertebrate. So a lot of these questions have to do with arthropods. Some of them have to do just with invertebrates themselves, okay? Here we go, www.kahoot.it. And the pin is going to be, loading, loading, one, two, two, eight, two. One, two, two, eight, two. So I hope you guys are all checking your messages 
on Monday morning, because remember, I will always let you know if there's anything that you need, like this time, I told you there that we would be doing a Kahoot, so you could be, be ready. Sometimes I'll tell you the supplies that you need to bring. Sometimes you'll need to print something, but I'll always let you know that. So make sure you check that message, even if you think there's nothing there. You know, even if you think, oh, I already know the link and I already remember, please do double check that just to make sure. All right, everybody in five, four, three, two, one. All right, here we go. Most of these are 10 second questions. So you have to answer quickly. A few of them are 20 if they're longer. Here is our first question. What does eukaryotic mean? Having many cells, cells with ribosomes, cells with nuclei, cells with flagella. Eukaryotic means having cells that contain nuclei. So right here, this is a eukaryotic cell. It has a nucleus and it has these membrane bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. So for those who picked having many cells, that's multicellular. That's the word that we mean when we have many cells. So the correct answer is cells that contain nuclei, which of course is the plural of nucleus. One nucleus, many nuclei. All right, let's see here. James got there first, followed quickly by Muhammad. Here we go. Next question, number two. What is a heterotroph? Heterotroph. Heterotroph is an animal that eats other organisms for energy. So an animal that makes its own food is an autotroph. It automatically makes food. Think of it that way. Troph means to eat. And hetero means to eat something different, something that's, that's an, another animal. So it is not an animal that makes its own food for energy. That is an autotroph. All right, let's see here. Drywall moves into first place. <laughs> Not sure who drywall is. All right, question three. Animals without backbones are called? All right, excellent. You better all get that one. That's what we've been studying for the last three weeks. <laughs> Animals without backbones are called invertebrates. They do not have vertebrae. All right, excellent. So that shouldn't change. And here we go, question four. What percent of all living animals are invertebrates? What percent of all living animals don't have a backbone? It is 95%. That means 95 out of every 100 animals that are on planet Earth don't have a backbone. That's a lot, but we don't know a lot about them. We don't study them as much because we're much more familiar with the ones that have a backbone. All right, so Felicity moves into second. Deja moves into third. Question five. The members of Kingdom Animalia that do not have true tissues are? There's only one member of Kingdom Animalia, the animal kingdom, that don't have tissues. They are the sponges. They're the simplest of all the animals. Then a little bit more complex than that are the cnidarians. A little bit more complex than that are the echinoderms. And then, of course, the chordates are us. We're chordates. We have a spinal cord. And we do have a, um, we're not invertebrates. We do have a backbone and we do have true tissues. All right, I'm gonna go a little bit faster through this. Felicity takes the lead. Question six, double points on this one. An organism which during embryonic development, a mouth develops first. You know that when you get twice as many points. That is called a protostome protostome. So we are not protostomes. Our mouth does not develop first in um, when we're babies, when we're developing inside our mom. 
our anus actually develops first and the tube goes all the way up, then the mouth develops last. But in a, in a protostome, the mouth develops first. All right, so let's see who got double points on that one. All right, Drywall Muhammad got double points. Very good. I don't know who else. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. I hit the wrong. I hit the wrong button. There we go. All right, next. Question seven. Sponges are members of phylum. What phylum are sponges? Yay, phylum periphera, they are porous. That's the way I remember that one. Sponges are porous. They are members of phylum periphera. Let's move right on. Question eight. A digestive tract with two openings is called complete or incomplete? Where food goes out a different opening than it goes in. That is called complete. Remember that some animals like sponges, like cnidarians, they have an incomplete digestive tract. Their food goes in the same hole, the same opening that the waste products come out. So not a good thing. I'm glad to be have a complete digestive tract. All right, question nine. A juvenile or immature stage of an invertebrate is called... It is called a larva. Excellent. Very good, everybody. What is a kind of reproduction in which an animal simply divides into parts? Fission, fusion, fertilization. That is called fission. Fission. Fusing is when they would fuse together. They would uh, become one. Two fuse into one. Fission is where they break apart into two parts and each of those will develop into a new animal. All right, good. Question 11, another double points. Since during embryonic development, a human develops an anus before a mouth, humans are what? Which of those are humans? We are deuterostomes. Remember, protostomes is the one we had before. That was the ones that develop a mouth first. Deuterostomes develop an anus first. These are tough. That's why I made them worth twice as many points. So let's see how we did. All right, Muhammad comes up to third place. Question 12, multi-select. So pick more than one. What kind of symmetry, oh, that shouldn't be more than one, does a butterfly have? All right, guys, pick up, pick bilateral. That shouldn't be more than one. I'm sorry about that. I'll give you that one. Yeah, bilateral symmetry. Because you can draw a line right down the middle and it's approximately the mirror image, the same on both sides. All right, hopefully that's the only one I messed up on. Yeah, what kind of symmetry does a glass sponge have? No symmetry at all, called asymmetry. Excellent. Question 14, what kind of symmetry does a jellyfish have? The last one, radial, radial, excellent. All right, question 15. Medusa, polyp and medusa are two body plans for sponges, cnidarians, or flatworms. Nidarians, and remember in that word, the C is silent. Nidarians, right, right. So we've got the polyp, which is the upright one where the tentacles stick up, and then the medusa, which is the jellyfish one where they the tentacles hang down like a bell shape. Nidarians have tentacles with stingers. These stingers are called what? They're called nematocysts. Nematocysts is what those stingers are called. They're like little spring-loaded spears. Question 17, pick more than one. Insects have three body sections. What are they?
What are those three body sections in an insect? Excellent. They are the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Well done. All right, everybody got that one? Question 18, another multi-select. Which are true of arachnids? Very good, except they do have four pairs of legs. A lot of you guys didn't know that. All arachnids have two body sections. All They have the head and then they have what's called the cephalothorax. All arachnids have four pair of legs. Remember spiders have eight legs, that's four pair. And spiders, ticks, mites, and scorpions are all arachnids. They do not have antennae. They do not have antennae. All right, next question. Pick more than one. Which are true of crustaceans? Crustaceans. You have to remember what crustaceans are for this one. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So they have an exoskeleton on the outside. They have those jointed limbs and crabs, lobsters, and pill bugs are examples of crustaceans. Very good. Let's see how we're doing here. Drywall keeps the lead. James and Muhammad not far behind. Question 20, pick more than one. Getting the idea here. Which are true of mollusks? Mollusks. are true of mollusks. All of them are true. They're all true of mollusks. They're often, they are soft-bodied animals. They don't always have a shell, but they often do. Like or octopuses, they're mollusks, but they don't have a shell. Gastropods, like snails though, they do have a shell. They're also mollusks. So are bivalves like oysters. All right, excellent job. Another multi-select, which are true of echinoderms. Echinoderms. Which are true of echinoderms. They have spiky skin and examples of them are sea stars. Sometimes we call them starfish. It's not a good name because they're not fish. So sea stars, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, those are all animals that have that spiky skin and they are echinoderms. Very good, you guys are doing great. Look at those high numbers. One more here. Which are in, which are in phyla, oh, sorry. Which of those are phyla in Kingdom Animalia? All of them. Well, not archaea. I'm sorry. <laughs> I looked at that. Archaea are a kind of uh, um, prokaryote. They're a single celled organism that doesn't have a nucleus. They're not considered an animal. They're not in animal kingdom, right? So they are not in, um, they're not animals. But platyhelminths, those are flatworms. Sponges, that's periphera. And cnidarians, the ones that have those nematocysts, those stinging spell uh, cells, those are all in the animal kingdom. Yeah, I know that happens sometimes. <clears throat> all right, so James takes the lead. Question 23, which are true of nematodes? Nematodes. Nematode. They're roundworms. That's the only thing true about them. They can't be both roundworms and flatworms. Nematode are roundworms. Remember, there's those three phyla of worms. There's the segmented ones. And I always think of the segmented as being like Anna the earthworm. They're annelids. Anna the earthworm annelids are 
um, one, one of the phyla. The other phyla are the flatworms and platy and flat, plat and flat rhyme. So platy helmets are flatworms and then roundworms are what's left. They're the nematodes, right? See who got that one. Drywall got that one, moves it back into the lead. Here we go. Two more questions, which are true of annelids? I just gave you a hint. Just gave you a hint. Anna. Only they are segmented worms. They're not usually parasites, not very often. So Anna the earthworm is the segmented worm. All right, last question. Insects are Platy helmets, arthropods, mollusks, or echinoderms. Which of those does? Yeah, they are arthropods. Remember, plat and flat. Platy is a flatworm. The platy helminth is a flatworm. Arthropods is what uh, insects are. Excellent. All right, let's see how we did. Third place, Muhammad. Well done. Second place, James. And in first place. All right, drywall. You wanna you wanna let us know who you are, drywall? Yeah, drywall beat everybody. Drywall wants to stay anonymous. <laughs> all right, all right. You don't get credit if you stay anonymous. All right, well done. You guys did really well. Most of you knew most of those questions, so that is excellent. Um, let me let, let's see here. Oh, cancel this. See the summary. Okay, so that's the whole thing. Okay, we're just gonna stop that. All right, and leave. Excellent job, everybody. All right, so like I said, we are saying goodbye to our invertebrate friends. And this week you're starting to learn about fish. So what's the difference between fish and fishes? Anybody know? Hiba. Fish is the like singular, um, and fishes is like mul when you're talking about multiple or all. That's really, really close. It's a little bit more detailed than that, but you've got the right idea. So the plural of fish is usually fish. When you're referring though to more than one species of fish, that's when you use fishes as the plural. So you're right, more than one, but you have to say species after it, more than one species. So look at this here, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, right? We're using the word fish here because we just got one of each kind of species or two fish of each kind of species. When we have all of one species, even if they're all the same, you know, even if there's a bunch of them, we use fish. This tank is full of fish. They're all the same kind of fish, but the ocean is full of fishes. So when we've got, it's, I know that's a little bit confusing, Fish can refer to many fish, even if they're all the same species. We use the word fishes when we have multiple species of fish. And a lot of times we really just use it when we're talking scientifically is when we use fishes. So you don't have to remember that. For the most part, you know, in our class, we can go back and forth. We can use fish and fishes. All right, let's quickly review these, um, these stages of life, these hierarchies that we have here. So we've got life and then domain. What comes after domain in this hierarchy? Remember, dear King Philip cried, oh, for goodness sake. Good, James. Kingdom. What's after kingdom? Felicity. Phylum. Phylum. What's after phylum? Dear King Philip cried. What's the C stand for? Yeah, you guys got it, Muhammad and James, Alistair, good, class, class. Now what's not, what's after class? Hiba. Order. Order, and then after order? Beth. Family. Family. Next. Felicity. Genus. Genus, and finally, Hiba. Species. Very good. Very good. Domain, life, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This is all just ways that we can study them by making them smaller groups. So the smallest of all these, the one with the fewest members is going to be the species. The one with the most members is going to be the domain. 
and they just get bigger as we go up this ladder, so to speak, right here. All right, now let's look at the kingdoms. Remember, we've got life and then domain kingdom. Let's look at the kingdom. Remember, there are six of them. There are six kingdoms. What is the one called that contains, um, they look like Hershey Kisses. Let me look at this. Yeah, they do. They do look like Hershey Kisses. Yep. So when we're looking at the kingdoms, the simplest kingdom, the one that contains the organisms that are often found in really hostile, extreme environments. Anybody remember what those are called? We only really touched on it briefly. Hibba. Are those amoeba or... Oh, you're so close. Really close. Felicity. Bacteria. Bacteria is next. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people will call these something bacteria, but we really shouldn't. So I'll tell you, they're called archaea. A lot of books and a lot of people will say archaebacteria. They shouldn't be that because they're not a kind of bacteria. So we're getting away from that name and starting to call them archaea. We will talk about them just before the semester ends, right before the holiday break. Now, the next one, Beth, what's the next one? Was it Beth or was it Felicity? I'm sorry. <laughs> one of you, one of you guys said uh, bacteria. Who said bacteria? Uh, sorry, Felicity. All right. Bacteria are next. Now, notice these are both prokaryotes. Remember I told you those are two words that are good to remember, prokaryote and eukaryote. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. They don't have organelles inside them, but eukaryotes like us, we do have that nucleus. So the very simplest of all of the eukaryotes are ones that are called protists. Once again, we'll talk about protists a little bit later. Then we move into fungi and we'll talk about them later too. Then we move into plants or kingdom plantae and finally animals. That's what we're doing this semester. We're doing the animal kingdom. But all those other kingdoms of life are important. They all play a really big role. So we're working now with kingdom animalia. So now I want to talk about how, remember, we can subdivide kingdoms into different phyla. Let's talk about the phyla or phylums, plural. It's called phyla that are in kingdom animalia. All right, now here they all are. Periphera, Cnidaria, platyhelminths, nematode, annelida, arthropoda, mollusca, echinodermata, and chordata. Those are the nine major animal phyla. There's a lot of minor ones, but we just deal with the major ones. So let's see if we can remember their common names. What is the common name for animals that are in the phylum periphera? Felicity. Sponges. Yes, sorry about that. I thought I had that turn. Let me let me silence my phone. I usually do before class. Don't want it to keep keep ringing. Okay, there we go. All right. Yes, you are right. It is sponges. What about this one here? What is the common name for these? Just about what what it is there. And the, the common name we have is Nidarians. That's what we call them. Yep, yep. Remember the C though, James. The C's, you have to spell it with the C, but you don't have to say it. We don't say it with the C. All right, can somebody give me an example of a Nidarian? Beth. A jellyfish. Yeah, jellyfish, excellent. How about another example? Jellyfish, what else? Felicity. Anemone. An anemones, yep, yep. What else? Corals, corals are examples of cnidarians. Sea pens, like the ones that we saw deflate and go into the ground a couple weeks ago. Um, sea fans are beautiful. Portuguese man of war is a collection of different, um, sorry, cnidarians that all work together. Excellent. So what do all cnidarians have? Hiba. Like the sort of stinger protection thing. Yeah, excellent. Those stinging cells. Anybody remember what the stinging cells are called? They were in the quiz. Beth. Nematodes. Very close. Very close. A nematode actually is a kind of an organism. It's nematocyst. But you're very, very close. Excellent job. All right. 
What are platy helmets? What's the common name for platy helmets? Felicity. Flatworms. They are flatworms. Excellent. They are flatworms. And then what are nematodes? Nematoda. Phylum nematoda. Nematode. Yep, James has got it. They are roundworms. And then annelids. Think Anna the earthworm. Annelids. Heba. Segmented. Yes, they are segmented worms. Excellent. Very, very good. All right, what's next? What do we call these? It's another easy one. Deja. Insects. Insects are kind of this. Excellent. Insects are kind of this. What do we call the whole group? Yeah, Muhammad's got it. Arthropods. We, and insects are arthropods. Crustaceans are arthropods. Uh, well, some. Um, the... Um, uh, arachnids, that's what I was trying to think, are arthropods. Bugs are arthropods. Very good. All right. So um, what do we call, uh, uh, there's two kinds of myriapods that fit in arthropod category. Anybody remember what the myriapod, remember pod means feet. So what are the two kinds of myriapods that we have? Centipede is one, James. Good. What's the other one? And millipede. Excellent. Very, very good. All right. Next, what are, what are these? What's the common word for mollusca? Anna. Mollusks? Yeah. Easy enough. Mollusks. They're just called mollusks. Isn't it funny how some of them, you know, platy helmets, we, we have a like real common name for, but mollusca, we just call mollusks. Excellent. So can you give me an example of a mollusk? Anybody? Beth. Oysters. Yep, oysters. What else? Mussels. Mussels. Clams. Snails. Things with shells. I think things with, with seashells on them. But there's one kind that's kind of big and kind of cool. Has a bunch of tentacles hanging down. It's a mollusk. Real smart. Yeah, cephalopods, cephalopods, like the octopus. Excellent. All right, now, echinodermata. What do we call these? Yep, they are echinoderms. They are echinoderms. Remember, they've got kind of spiky skin. So like a sand dollar, a sea urchin, a sea star, a brittle star. There's a lot of these ones that have star at the end of them. There's sea lilies and feather stars and all kinds of really cool shapes of these echinodermata or echinoderms. And then finally, we're back to this one. What do all chordates have? Yeah, they're almost all vertebrates. Now there are a couple of examples of ones that are not, but we don't worry about them. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly talk about them when we talk about chordates. For the most part though, almost all chordates have that backbone, that spinal cord, that um, vertebrae. So mammals would be a good example birds, amphibians, reptiles, and da, 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 fishes, which we're going to be studying next. We're going to talk about fishes. All right, so before we move on to invertebrates, remember we learned that 90, actually 97, somewhere between 95 and 97 percent of all of the animals in animal kingdom are made up of invertebrates. Now, somewhere around 85 percent of all of the animals on earth are arthropods. So by far, arthropods are the largest phyla that we have, by far. That's what insects fit into. They are arthropods. Now take a look at all of these. This is all the members of kingdom animalia. You can really see on this chart here how many animals are arthropods. Remember, there's somewhere around 85% of all animals on earth. So in this, we can see the percentage. A pie chart's a good way to show percentages. So all together, these would add up to 100. Now, on this pie chart, you can also see things like um, bryzoa and peripher, well, and, and 14 minor phyla, um, in addition to the ones that we learned about. So these are these are minor phyla because there just aren't very many of them. I mean, look at bryzoa, bryzoa right here. It's just tiny little bit. It doesn't make up much. 
But let's take a look at them. Let's look at one of these minor phyla, these bryzoa that we have. Sometimes bryzoa are called moss animals. And they're, uh, they're really simple. They're filter feeders. They live in the water. Basically, I think they're kind of cool. They're a little worm, worm-like animal that has a nose and then tentacles around the outside. And they sit down inside a little box. When they think it's a good idea, they open the door of their box and they poke their tentacles out and they catch something. So when they think food is going by, they open up their box. So this is what they look like. They're a little tube shaped animal, all of this right here. And they've got this nose right in here and the tentacles that, that stick around the outside. So they can open up the lid of this little box that they sit down inside and then they catch the tentacles. Now, if you've ever picked up a frond of kelp at the beach and there's a little white crust like this that looks kind of like a net inside these little holes in there, that's where those bryozoans live. Inside, that's their little box. You can see here, this is a kind of a microscopic picture. Here they are poking their tentacles out of the little box. The idea here, what I want you to get from this is that there are a lot of unusual animal species. Please spend some time with your book, looking through the pictures, reading some of that content, because we can't go into detail about every single animal that's in your book, but there's a lot of really fun ones. All right. So they're all pretty fascinating. The major ones are the ones that we learned about. All right. All right. We've got these two terms that we use to refer to different animals. So venomous and poisonous, they both refer to an animal that contains a toxin. The main difference is the way they get that toxin into their victim. Anybody know the difference? What's the difference between poisonous and venomous? Felicity. Poison is secreted, venom is injected. Yeah, very good, very good, excellent. So poison is delivered through either touching something and it gets into your skin or you eat it, you ingest it. Poison is almost always a defense mechanism. Poisonous animals are not very aggressive on their own. They're what we would call passive aggressive. So they won't actively attack, but when they think they're being attacked, they might release their toxin then um, as a result of being disturbed or bothered. Now, an example would be a cane toad. This is a kind of a toad that secretes toxins from glands on its shoulder. And it's really poisonous, but you have to either ingest it or lick it in order to be able to be affected by that poison. An example of a poisonous plant is poison ivy. All you have to do is touch that poison ivy and you can get this itchy, um, rashy, painful spot that uh, nobody likes. Nobody likes poison ivy. So poison is something that you touch or eat. Venom is injected. So like a bite or sharp spines that will penetrate your skin that'll get inside. Now, venom actually has a mixture of big molecules and little molecules. So it needs a wound to be able to get into the body. And it has that wound usually by delivering it through spikes. So something either bites you or it, there's spines that will poke their way in. So in order to be effective, the venom has to get into the bloodstream. It has to find some way into the blood of the animal. So venomous animals are usually more active in defending themselves. Now, once in a while, an animal can be both. It can be both venomous and poisonous. So I'm gonna tell you some scenarios and you tell me if they are venomous or poisonous. So this is a puffer fish. You should not eat them. Are they venomous or poisonous? Hiba. Um, poisonous. Yeah, poisonous. In order to be affected by something poisonous, you either have to touch it and have it absorbed through your skin, or you have to eat it. Now, most puffer fish have what's called a neurotoxin. That means it's a toxin to your nervous system. It is so powerful, it's believed that the venom, well, the, the poison that's in one puffer fish could kill 30 adults from just one puffer fish. So they are the second most poisonous vertebrate in the world. Anybody have any idea what the most poisonous vertebrate is? It's not a, not a fish, give you a hint. 
Deja. A snake? That's a very good guess. A snake would be venomous because it's going to bite to inject its toxin in. So I'm looking at something that you either have to eat or touch. Yeah, James has got it here. Poison dart frog, right, is the most venomous vertebrate in the world. I'm sorry, I said the wrong word. The most poisonous vertebrate in the world. And what's really interesting is there's no known cure for their toxin. Now, the problem is, since you have to eat them, in, I mean, the good thing is, in the, since you have to eat them in order to be bothered by puffer fish, you can swim around them and they don't, they're no harm to you. They're no threat to divers at all. All right, here's another one here now. If you are poked by one of the spines on the fins of this lionfish, it could kill you. Is that venomous or poisonous? Hibba. Um, venomous. Yeah, that is going to be venomous because you have to be poked by it. It has to be injected into you. So lionfish are really well known for their venomous spines. So you don't want to go swimming with lionfish because they could poke you. Now, usually... Um, they're really painful, but they're not they're not fatal most of the time. Uh, a lionfish doesn't have enough of the venom in order to be painful. All right, this is a kind of a parasitic catfish. It is called a kandaroo. It can get up to one inch long. So they're tiny, tiny little catfish. What they do is they get up into the gill cavities of other fish, and then they stick out their spines. And those spines inject their poison into their victim. Are they venomous or poisonous? Felicity. Venomous. Yes, they are venomous, right? So when they inject their venom into their victim, it can cause bleeding, it can cause inflammation, it can even cause death to the animal. All right, how about this one? You've got to kind of look carefully to see him. There's his eye, there's his mouth. So. Moray eels are eaten in some parts of the world, but their flesh is sometimes toxic and can cause illness or death if you eat them. So are they poisonous or venomous? Alistair? Poisonous. They're poisonous. You have to eat them in order to be bothered by them. Excellent. All right. How about this one? This is a blue ringed octopus. It can bite with its beak, but it also can damage you if you eat it. Mohammed. Uh, poisonous and, ven and venomous. Yeah, it's going to be both. That's because it has a bunch of different kinds of toxins in it. So it's venomous when it bites you. It's poison if it's, if it's swallowed. Right. So keep that in mind, B the difference between venom and poison. So uh, like a rattlesnake will bite you with its uh, most dangerous animal in the world. I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard that. You know, a lot of these kind of most dangerous, most venomous, most poisonous, it really depends on who you ask. If you were to do a Google search for it, you might find uh, a couple different answers. Let me, let me look it up quick. What is the most dangerous animal in the world? Ah, oh, mosquitoes. <laughs> mosquitoes kill more people than any other creature. Who'd have thought that? Yeah, well, a lot of the reason for that is because they spread diseases. They spread diseases like uh, malaria and yellow fever. Uh, West Nile is one. Um, so there's a lot of different diseases. Yeah, interesting. All right, let's talk about fish because we're going to be learning about them for the rest of the week. Two as humans, <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. All right, now. Let's look at a couple of things about fish, some in general things about fish anatomy. Remember, anatomy is the shape of something or the structure that it is, and physiology is how that works. So let's look at the different mouths that fish have. They have different kinds of mouths because they eat different kinds of foods. So we've got mouths that are like this. They're called terminal. They just open straight ahead. There are some mouths that point up, and they're called superior. Then there's some that point down. Those are called subterminal. You can see why that's called tubular, and you can see why that's called elongated. And then these little things that hang down, those are called barbels. Now, they hold taste buds. So there's actually taste buds on these little things that hang down from, from the um, bottom of their chin there, and they search for food in dirty water using their taste buds right there. 
So let's take a look at some of the different kinds of fish. So what kind is this one right here? Terminal. What? Terminal. Yeah, that's just pretty straight open. It's gonna be straight in, in the front. Now, so um, this one has actually hard plates at the top and the bottom. This is called a beak mouth fish and it has hard plates. This allows it to crush hard shells as it's going along. This one is called a sucker mouth. So this sucker mouth helps fish to scrape algae off of rocks or driftwood. And because their mouth sticks out a little bit, they can reach a little bit farther. They can actually even use this mouth to anchor themselves in a strong current so they're not washed away if the current's really strong. This one here, this is called an inferior mouth. So that's not in one of these pictures. It points down. Where the superior points up, the inferior points down. Think about what you would want, uh, Alistair. Is inferior like the mix between uh, subterminal and tubular? Um, it's different. It's different. It's not really a mixture of the two. It's just a different mouth shape. Yeah, they're all different depending on what they eat. So what do you think these ones with the inferior mouth are going to eat? Where where in the ocean are they going to get their food? If your mouth's pointing down, where do you think you get go looking for food? Probably somewhere on the ground. Somewhere on the ground. Yeah, they're bottom feeders. So they're going to eat shellfish and crustaceans. Now there's also mouths like this one. <laughs> These are called protrusible. They're, they stick way out. They help fish reach food that's pretty far away. Let's look at a couple of those. This is one that has a terminal mouth. So it's kind of open straight ahead, pointing up just a little bit, but not very much. This is a yellowfin tuna and it eats other fish. It just eats other fish. Now let's look at one that points up that's superior. So you can kind of compare it. This is the mouth right here, all the way from there to there. So this is called a tarpon and they usually eat schooling fish. So as they're swimming along, fish are schooling above them and they'll go at them because their mouth points up. This one has that inferior mouth. This is a cowfish. It's a honeycomb cowfish. And they're going to be scavenging the bottom, looking for things that are on the ground. Now, these guys, they look for dead things, um, waste products, bits of dead and decaying organisms. Not, not a fun diet. Sometimes aren't you just really glad you're a human <laughs> when I hear about some of these things with animals? This is a protrusible. We looked at him before. This is a hogfish and they eat mostly mollusks and crustaceans. So take a look at this one. Based on their mouth shape, how do you think these Northern anchovy eat? Look at, their, look at how wide open their mouths are. Felicity. Filter feeders. Yeah, they're gonna strain the water or filter the water. Think about when, you, when you're cooking and you use a slotted spoon and you scoop and you only get the pasta and the water stays behind, that's kind of how these filter feeders eat. They take in all the water, they filter out the food and the water goes back out. So they um, water will pass back out through their gills right here. All right, how about this one? This is the mouth of the spiny dogfish. How do you think it eats? Muhammad. Am I biting something? Yeah. Think, think about the way you use a knife and a fork. You grab a hold of your food and then you cut it. So those teeth that they have there is to grip and rip. They bite and then they'll rip it. Now they get their name because they, they're called the spiny dogfish because they feed in packs, just like wild dogs do. Now these jaws that they have here with these teeth on it, that allows them to grip and rip just about anything. What do you think these eat? What, what utensil that you use is similar to the way they're going to eat their food? Mohammed. Probably something like very like one of those insects or something in the water. Like something in the water? Yeah. Something like, you know how like flamingos, they drink like water, like they eat the small things in the water, something yep. like that. Yep. This is called a pipe fish or bay pipe fish and kind of has a mouth that looks a little bit like a straw, doesn't it? Or think like a turkey baster. So they're going to eat those um, zooplankton, the small things that are in the water. They have that tubular mouth because they're going to slurp up 
those small creatures that they find. And here's one that just gulps its food. This is called a tiger rockfish. And it's similar to, what, to the way people use a ladle to scoop soup up. So they just take in everything that they gulp everything down. Um, they can gulp just about anything with meat on it, even animals that fight back on their way down. So these are kind of tough fish. And how about this one? This is a coho salmon. Think about, think about a utensil in your kitchen that would work like that. Hibba. I guess like a knife-ish. Yep, like a knife or something that pinches like that. Felicity. Tongs. Yeah, like tongs, like you pick up salad with. So that mouth almost looks like, like well, what it really looks like is tongs with knives at the end of it, doesn't it? Because they got some sharp uh, points right here. So they're going to pick that up. Now, when they um, are young and they live in streams, they eat primarily animals that have legs, so not other fish. When they get out into the ocean, they're primarily going to eat other fish, animals that have fins in them. All right, let's spend a couple minutes, we're about out of time, but I wanna show you guys some of the weirdest fish in the ocean. Look at that. <laughs> so this is called a common fang tooth. It's a really small deep sea fish. It has some of the largest teeth in the ocean proportional to its size. Look at the size of the teeth compared to even the rest of the face that it has there. And of course, you've all probably seen pictures of the blob fish. The blob fish lives on the bottom of the ocean. It can live um, up to 900 feet deep. It's rarely seen by humans. The thing is, this is not what it looks like in its natural habitat. This is what it looks like when we bring it up and gravity starts affecting it in a way that it doesn't down in the ocean. Down in the ocean, this is what it looks like. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, they're very different when they come out of water. How about this one? Call this a bubblehead. <laughs> this is an Aranda goldfish. Now, this hood that it has on it, uh, these bubbles, these air and water filled spaces cover its whole head except for its mouth and its eyes. This one is called a stargazer. You can see why. It lives half buried on the ocean reef um, near Kom Komodo Island. It lays there looking up, just waiting to open that superior mouth if some small fish swims by. You wouldn't even know it was there if you weren't looking for it. Look at this guy here. This is called an Asian sheep's head wrasse. So it's got these this jetting thick lips and that unique jaw structure. Isn't that really funny how that jaw, the forehead and the jaw, I know they are kind of ugly looking. How about this one here? This is called a scorpion fish. It's a tasseled scorpion fish. This is venomous. So venom, remember venom has to be injected. So it's got these spines here. It's also carnivorous, meaning it eats other animals. And take a look at this one. These are called frogfish. So they're kind of interesting the way frogfish move. They sort of hop around along the bottom of the ocean. They look a little bit like frogs jumping along as they, as they go. Now they use mimicry. They use a kind of a camouflage to hide from their predators. They don't have any scales and that makes them a little bit unusual. Um, they also sometimes can have different kinds of textures. I like this one here. This is the boxfish. Now this is a baby. The very young boxfish is yellow, bright yellow, but it turns this grayish blue color when it gets older. And look out for this one. This is a stargazer. Once again, this is a, called a bulldog stargazer. So once again, it buries itself down in the sand waiting for its prey to go by and then it ambushes it. I like this one. I think it's kind of cool. This is like um, a, a kind of a, a frogfish. So it's got this psychedelic patterns. So it's called psychedelica. And it really looks like a rubber ball bouncing along the surface of the ocean as it's going. This one is that lionfish again. One of the things about lionfish is that they're an invasive species in some areas. That means they didn't, they didn't start there. They were carried or somehow got into an area where they just start consuming young and small fish and they can do a lot of damage to a habitat. And we're gonna end with this one here. This is a stone fish. Now they look like rocks. Again, here's the eye. This is the mouth right here. If they, if you step on them, they are very, very venomous. So they're dangerous to people. 
and they are considered the most venomous fish in the world. All right, um, the, the goldfish here, I, I just wanna show you this. I thought we were done, but I wanna show you one more thing. The goldfish is one of the earliest fish to be domesticated. That means kept as pets. And it's one of the most commonly kept aquarium fish. They can live up to 40 years. So be careful. If you'd go into the pet store and buy a goldfish, you may have it until you're 55 or 60 years old, right? They're, they're long living. The biggest goldfish ever was about fit, a one and a half feet long. This was Goldie. This is a picture of her with her owner. She weighed nearly 4.2 pounds. Now, if you do a Google search for the biggest goldfish, you'll, you'll get this picture. This picture will come up. But this is not a goldfish. Anybody know what kind of fish this is? Looks like a weird but snapper or something. Yeah, it kind of does. You, you can tell by these these barbels that hang down here. This is a kind of koi. Koi is a common carp, is what it's called. Now, goldfish don't have these barbels, but the koi do. And uh, they've also got a uh, thick fin running all the way down their back like this. If you can look at the two of them, you can see the difference. The goldfish has the really thin, translucent fin where the koi the uh, common carp, it's really thick like that. All right, with that, it is time to end class. So have fun learning about fish this week. Hope you guys have a great week. How do you catch that? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. With, a, with a strong, strong uh, fishing line. All right, have a great week, everybody. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, thank, thank you. you.